Seven of spades. Uh, eight of spades. King of spades. Four of spades. Queen of diamonds. Six of hearts. Queen of hearts. Jack of diamonds. Queen of clubs. Jack of clubs, yes? yes. Um, ace of diamonds. Um, ace, of, ace of hearts. Nine of spades. Four of diamonds. Nine of clubs. Six of diamonds. No. Six of clubs. Six of clubs, sorry. No, I know that. <laughs> Six of clubs. Um, five of clubs. Uh, Six of diamonds. Queen of spades. Three of spades. Ten of clubs. Three of diamonds. Ten of hearts. Four of clubs. The last two are Ace of Spades, Eight of Clubs. Right. <laughs> I just make one mistake and that happens occasionally, but there you go. Um, so that was half of the deck, and I did it in about three minutes. So this is a demonstration of what you can really accomplish with certain techniques. So it's not just imaginary things that other people do that aren't you. It's very, very accomplishable. So before I get into the meat of my presentation, I'm going to do a little test here. So I'm going to play a video, and it's going to flash 32 pictures for less than a second. And I want you all to try to remember these pictures. So focus. Yeah, <laughs> and, you're very see them. That's the and there's going to be a little test later on. So 
that is another very important aspect of memory. But you might be wondering, what am I interested in this project? Well, I'm interested in how we can improve our memory, how we can remember a lot of different things. And you're, you might be asking yourself, how are we going to remember everything in the world? There's too much. It's impossible. It's, it's, it's too much. There's nothing that can internalize all of these memories. And in some way, I would say that you are correct. But in other ways, I would say that there are lots of things in life that we are missing out on because we simply don't understand how our memory works in order to take advantage of it. So this was my question. And my ultimate answer to that question, I won't leave you hanging, I'll tell you the answer right now, was it took me about six minutes and 30 seconds after one month of memory training to remember the order of one deck of cards. So that's 52 cards. Since then, I've been able to bring it down to five minutes, 30 seconds. So that's maybe two months of training. So the question that I'm going to look into in this presentation is how the heck did I cram 52 cards into my brain? Here we go. So human memory is not just one kind of memory. Remembering what happened to you on your last birthday is not the same as remembering all of the years for World War II in the same way that remembering what someone just said in class when you say, oh, were you listening? Can you repeat what I just said? is different than remembering what you were just writing on your notes. So sensory memory is the memory that happens when you're, you're hearing things. So you can probably tell me the words I just said for less than a second. If I asked you, what did I just say? You could say, oh, well, you said, if I asked you, what did I just say? But if you think past that, I bet you can't tell me the first word that I started this presentation with. Right? So that's okay. sensory memory, is it stays in there, you know, visual memories are the same thing. So if you see an image flashed very quickly, you will remember that image perfectly for less than a second, and after that it starts to degrade. So that's sensory memory. Short-term memory, as it says there, is working memory. So this is the kind of memory that you might not have in your long-term processor, so you might not remember a week later, but something that you remembered at the start of class, you might remember <coughs> at the end of class. This is the kind of memory you're exercising when you're cramming for a test. So let's say you're sitting in class, it's a break, you know there's a test in this block, and you're just looking over the notes to get it in your short-term memory. That's what it is. And long-term memory is the one that I was really most interested in, because it's the most permanent, and it's the one where you can really encode things reliably. So under long-term memory, I was looking at explicit memory. Implicit memory is things that we remember without purposely remembering them. So muscle memory. By doing a task over and over again, you remember it. Explicit memory is something that you would commit to memory on purpose. So declarative memory, that's also called declarative memory. Episodic memory down here is memories for what happened to you in your life. So that's episodic memory was what we were looking at when we were talking about the children, remembering where the line is in. But the kind of memory that I'm interested in in my product project is semantic memory, which it turns out is the a memory that is the hardest to encode in long-term memory because it's for facts and concepts rather than events and experiences. And humans are very, very good at remembering what happened to them, but not very good at remembering, let's say, the numbers that went along with those experiences. For example, I'm sure you can remember an instance in which you tripped and spilled food all over the floor, or in your birthday and it was just a horrible birthday, or something that you did that really made an impact. But I bet you can't tell me the exact date, unless it was your birthday, the exact date, <laughs> the exact date of, of what happened. So think back to maybe the, the day you, fir you first got your pet, or the day you first went to school, something like that, but you wouldn't be, you'd be able to remember how you felt, but you wouldn't be able to remember you know, the date associated with that. So unfortunately, I'm looking at semantic memory with cards. So the goal here is how do we turn semantic memories into something as easily memorable as episodic memory? Well, it turns out there's a common problem used to illustrate this. It's called the Baker-Baker paradox. And what this was is it was a psychological experiment that's been repeated many times with the same results. And what happens is you have two groups of people. You give them both the same headshot, this headshot, not necessarily this one, a headshot. And you tell the first group of people that his name is Baker. And you ask them to remember that. You tell the second group of people that he is a Baker. Now you would think that after a couple of days, people would be able to tell the names again, and it turns out that half of them did. In fact, 
With 98% certainty, the people who was told that he was a baker remembered his name more than the people who were told that he, his name was baker. And you, you'd ask yourself, why, why is this? It's the same word. It's exactly the same word. But the thing is, when you make memories, you are essentially taking what's happening here and connecting it back to everything you learned before, making connections. That's what you're in the background, all the neural connections. So with the name Baker, you might have one or two connections. Maybe you had a childhood friend whose last name was Baker. You're thinking of it as a name, so you don't have as many connections as when you're told that he is a Baker. Now suddenly, you have all, every time you step into a bakery, every memory of the time you smelt bread, every time you bake cookies, everything that has to do with wheat, with bread, with smelling bakery things, all of that gets connected to this head. And suddenly, this headshot is much more ingrained in your memory. So what I'm trying to do with cards is turn capital B bakers into lowercase b bakers so that I can remember them more. So how do we do this? Well, we can take advantage of a couple of kinds of memory that humans are really innately good at. For example, spatial memory. Humans have an amazing spatial memory. This is a little bit obvious if you look at evolutionarily speaking. It would be very good to remember where you found water, or remember where the poisonous plant was that you stepped on last time, or where your friend got hurt so you can find them again in the forest. So spatially, our memories have developed very, very well. I bet you can think back to a house that you've maybe only been in once, somewhere that you stayed in one night, and picture pretty much exactly the room layout, and maybe a couple of things that were sitting on side tables and some plants in the corner. And I bet if you think about your own house, you can picture almost, not, all, not even almost exactly, but exactly, because you were probably there this morning. So, <laughs> point being, humans have very, very good spatial memories. They also have very good visual memories. And we did a little test earlier with some images. So we're going to see, oh, wait, this is a video. Does <laughs> <laughs> oh. it have sound? No. Oh, wait. Wait. How do you recognize these people? How do you? How do you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It's a little louder. Is the other one after people? Oh, I heard something. I heard something. That's good. Is it all the way up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one. Computer volume. Turn the computer volume on. Oh, no, you still can't hear it. Once it hits all the way up. Is the computer volume? There's so many volumes. Is there a volume button? Computer volume and the YouTube volume are different things. That's all the way up. Thanks for confirming that, Mira. Uh, it's, I heard sound from it, so it's on. Oh, 
proceeds to do, what Sherlock proceeds to do in this clip is have all these fancy graphics and animations and he uses his hands and says words come in here and then fakes come in here and he's remembering all this stuff and in truth that's not exactly what it looks like when someone's remembering from their memory palace. In truth it looks more like this. This is pictures of people who are world memory championships. Now they've got two key components. They've got the mind the, or the, the noise blocking headphones and earmuffs which will keep from distractions and special glasses which allow them to concentrate on just one thing at a time. So this is what people wear when memorizing cards or numbers or poems for mm, like world recognition. So not quite so glamorous, but it is a real technique. It's called the Loki method. And you might be thinking Loki, but it's not Loki. It's Loki. Some people pronounce it Loci, but it means plural of location. So location in Greek. It was invented in ancient Greece by a poet, well, reputably, I mean, we can't really be sure from back then, but reputedly by a poet who was in a banquet hall reciting poetry, but he was called out by some messengers, so he went outside for a minute, when he came, and he turned around, and the banquet hall collapsed. Anyway, the banquet hall collapsed, and all the bodies of the people of the various Roman, and, or the various Greek fancy, very important people were mangled. So when their fa families came to pick them up, they couldn't tell where they were. And he found that by thinking back in his head, he could remember exactly where they were sitting, and so help the families find the bodies. Now this is a bit of a gruesome start to a really elegant method, but he realized that he could have replaced the dead people with anything he wanted. So the order of all of the Canadian prime ministers could be sitting at that table. You think back to it, now you've got more memory. Hmm? Sorry. Okay. All right. So the way that it works, essentially, is you take a list of things, or words, or semantic memories, facts, or concepts that are hard to memorize on their own. You convert them into something memorable, like images, visual memory, and place them in a map or a root, spatial memory. And now suddenly you've made use of the two best types of human memory. This method was very, very widely used when printing presses were not around. Because how did you expect? To memorize, to know what you need to know for your profession or your job or what you're doing without having some sort of memory technique. If you were only going to see a book once, you would want to have as much information in your head from that book as you could. So it was also used for, um, for Greek orators and Roman orators would use this technique. In fact, there was a time in which emperors and kings were expected to have memorized the first and last names of every person that they were in charge of, which is crazy if you think about it now. No one is expected to memorize that, but it shows you how just how widespread and how widely used this technique was, was 
used by. So we're going to go into some examples of how this works. So the step one is to make a root, or a place, or a mind palace, something that has a logical connection from image to image. So we all know the school pretty well. So we're going to use a common mind palace background, which is the school. So we'll start picturing your heads now, third floor hallways. You can look, you can see kind of the stairwell opening there. We've got a mural here, there's a glass case, and you can go downstairs. So this is a really good route because we are all familiar with it. The key to being a route is something that you're not going to forget. Now, I find that I never have issues remembering routes because spatial memory is really good. So the next step is you want to memorize some things. So I've got some random nouns up here which we're going to try placing in our route of the third floor hallway. So the first one is cardigan. Now you might be wondering, how am I supposed to remember the word cardigan? Well, the hint here is to be really, really creative and have lots and lots of detail. So for example, cardigan. I would come up with something really crazy that I would definitely remember. I would picture a gigantic chicken wearing a cardigan. Maybe it's flapping everywhere and throwing feathers around, and that is in the third floor hallway right next to the glass case and the mural, and it's coming right at me. Now that is memorable. You are not going to forget that. I guarantee you, you're going to wake up tomorrow and think of a giant chicken cardigan. <laughs> so that's where the stop sign. And maybe you could use that. You could say, OK, well, the next thing I'm going to do is interact with this giant chicken cardigan coming at me. So you can hold up a stop sign. That's a good way to interact. And you're going to remember it because it's the next logical step in your story or process of events. So you're walking on the third floor hallway. You see a chicken, you hold up a stop sign. You now have the words cardigan and stop sign. You have to remember that the chicken is wearing a giant cardigan. Mm -hmm. No, the next word is pancake. Now, I would place this pancake, I would make this pancake about this big. And you want to picture it covered in maple syrup and butter melting everywhere. And it's a great pancake. And maybe it has blueberries on it. And it's sitting at the top of the stairwell right over there, right at the top. And the only way to get down the stairs is to use it as a sled. So you have to put down your stop sign and hop on the pancake and right, go right down to the first floor landing. Now, you have memorized the words cardigan, stop sign, and pancake. Now, the next couple words, you could do the same sort of thing. So maybe for lace, you'd tie your shoe and it would turn into a sushi. Or then you would step in some jelly, or you would have to slide down the banister and it would be covered in jelly. Or maybe you have to wade through some jelly. Point being that it's very easy to have a lot of fun with this. And you can make the most crazy images which you will definitely, definitely remember. So essentially, this is what I'm doing with cards. So I have a system which I use on top of the, the Loki system. So with the Loki system, just on its own, you would have each card, you would make it into an image and place it along the route. But this is a much more efficient method. It actually is able to take three cards and make them into one image and place them on a route. It's called the person action object method. And I certainly didn't invent it. I learned it from a book which I read, written by Joshua Fuller, this book right over here. And he is a world memory championship person. And these people use this method. So these are a couple images of my person action objects. So each one of these images has a card associated with it. You take a card, and you make a person, an action, and an object to go with it. So for example, Harry Potter hanging from a broomstick. That's the two of clubs. Uh, we've got Great Gatsby swimming in a swimming pool, except in mine, he's actually swimming in a swimming pool full of jelly, or jello. Uh, so that's the ace of spades. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, he's actually tapping on a beehive in my person action object, and that is the five of hearts. So each image here has a card associated with it. It does require some time beforehand to memorize, but it's really, really, it's, it's quite efficient. So the way it works is you take the person from the first card, and the action from the second card, and the object from the third card, and you make them into one image, and that's the image that you place in your root. So for example, if I had the four of hearts, the four of clubs, and the jack of diamonds, that's this one, that one, and that one. So the four of hearts, that's Robin Hood shooting an arrow at a goose. I take Robin Hood. Here we got the four of clubs, that's the doctor, controlling the TARDIS. So we got kind of controlling, and then we got Gollum reaching for the ring, which is the Jack of Diamonds. So we have Robin Hood controlling the one ring. So you might picture him, and he's trying to figure out how it works, maybe something like that, and you, you put that in your mind palace, and suddenly you have three cards, 
in one image. And this method is also very effective because the person in whatever image you're placing is usually interacting with something else and motion and sound and more detail is involved when there's a person involved. So this sort of thing can be very, very memorable. You may be asking yourself, why do I want to memorize cards? What's the point in memorizing 52 cards apart from sit, like, you know, impressing people at parties? Well, I would say that it's not redundant. Because this is, OK, I'm going to explain this, this quote. This is my favorite quote from the book that I read. And it, it just, it's simply, these skills would be in God's head in high school. And I have to agree with him. I mean, there was a part in this book as well that he was talking about he had a friend who went to Vienna. And in Vienna, he, um, there, it was the night before their biggest exam of the year. And they were in college or university. And they partied until dawn the night before the biggest exam of the year. These are world memory championships. They're not like really, really productive people. They're just people who have learned to be very efficient with the way that they memorize things. So the story goes, they partied until dawn, woke up at noon, spent an hour cramming everything into his head using the Loki technique, and passed the exam. Which is pretty impressive, considering that apparently he knew nothing beforehand. So these techniques can help in high school, but not only that. They also, they can help things, they can help with things like, let's say you're at a party, and you need to remember you know, you're being introduced to about 500 different people, and you need to remember these names. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. So here you are at the party, and you know you've got all these names flashing by, and, and five minutes later you probably remember maybe one or two of them, and you might not even remember who those people were. This kind of technique can help you. So when you understand how your memory works, and how and what what is memorable to you, you can suddenly really create vivid images in your brain that will stick. You can spend a second memorizing something that normally it would take you a minute of repetition to memorize. So normally, you know, you go over the name. I recently, well, after I learned this technique, I learned I met a guy named Alexander, and I wanted to remember his name because it was going to be important for the future. So here we go. And I was like, okay, how do I memorize this? So I don't know if you guys know the Alexander plant, but we have it. It's all over in our backyard anyway. It's a plant. It's got leaves, and I know this plant. So I pictured his face. And there's leaves coming out of his hair and roots as the neck. And it's the Alexander plant. There you go. I spent about half a second doing this, and I've never forgotten his name. I, I literally, it's a great feeling when you can, you can be introduced to someone, and five minutes later, you can yell across the room, you know, hey, Jessica, how's it going? You know? <laughs> like, it's, it's just such a feeling of accomplishment. You're like, I remembered your name. And suddenly you have all these more connections. Anyway, so there are a couple small things you can do with memory, but not only that, is I find that the biggest thing that it allows me to do is, well, it allows me to understand my memory more. So I can be more efficient with my studying. But it also, it makes me more observant in this world. So, you know, you might say, oh, well, why do you want to be, or, I don't know, I feel like I'm pretty observant. But doing the memory stuff like this, it really gets you to, to notice, if you're making creative, detailed images in your mind, you are going to be looking out for creative and creatively made detailed images in the world. And you're going to appreciate certain things a lot more. So what I hope you take away from this is that memory techniques are something that you should know about, if only just for understanding how your memory works. And that they can be very useful in studying for tests. And generally, they make your life a little bit easier, although you have to be careful not to just party until dawn and then learn everything at noon. Anyway, so thank you very much. Yeah, we should do it. Okay. Uh, we, we can't go beyond 10 2, so we've got, you know, 10 or okay. a little more minutes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm open for questions. Yeah, this is Oh, um, so speaking of uh, the book that you had been looking about in yeah. Einstein, um, I remember, I mean, I don't remember obviously the date it came out, but I remember when it came out because the guy who <laughs> did the book, the guy who wrote the book was on the radio. Oh, okay. And um, he was doing an interview with like NPR or someone. Um, and it's just, it's weird because like normally these t memory techniques don't really work that well for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I haven't really put a lot of work into it, but I 
feedback memory. Okay. Well, but, the important um, thing is it's yeah. a skill that you can yeah. practice. Yeah, um, but I just, I remember, I guess it's a testament to like the memory technique itself is that I remember him being on the interview uh, on the radio in our old Toyota Corolla and I remember which stop sign we were at in the town I used to live in yeah. when he was talking about moonwalking with Einstein and how he was like, I, I think he said like, I guarantee you like 10 years down the line you'll probably remember me saying something about moonwalking with Einstein because it's just something you don't think of normally. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's a great realization when you can put things in your memory on purpose that just kind of stay there. Anyway, yeah, like I remember decks of cards that I remember last week, unfortunately, like it's like my Anyway, Henry. What would you say is the best memory technique to use when remembering passwords? Because that kind of stuff leaves my mind like the right. Americans left nom at the end of the war. <laughs> well, <laughs> I would say yeah, kind of the same thing for names. Like if your password is something with words and numbers, you can do the words thing like with the name, you know, you associate a picture and put that with your, maybe you associate it with whatever account it is that your password is. But then there are multiple systems to deal with numbers, and one is the PAO system. There's also a system called the major system, which I didn't talk about today, but you can see that um, you, you just associate certain letters and sounds with numbers, and then you make all these images. Um, so basically, I would say same sort of idea. So come up with something creative and detailed that you're definitely going to remember. That's what it is.